On this episode of the Commute Podcast, I talked to UX UI designer Nam Yoon Kim about microtransit. What does a designer know about microtransit? Well, turns out this guy knows a lot. Um, Nam Yoon Kim is somebody that I found on Medium two or three years ago because he was writing about his research on microtransit while working in South Korea. He was tasked with being part of a project to implement microtransit. Ultimately, it never ended up getting off the ground for a variety of reasons. Um, but he took all of his research and he put it online. And I think it's some of the most um, forward-thinking, accurate, and insightful information about the topic of microtransit. I've personally learned a lot from it, but also have validated that the things that he talked about, his concepts actually work. Um, he's got this model where he breaks down the different route service types in microtransit, ranging from fixed route to pure dynamic on-demand service. And I explained to him how the way we do things at Share Mobility, uh, the hybrid model where you're creating virtual bus stops and sometimes picking people up at your door and doing it all programmatically. That's really the killer application in microtransit. So I think Nam Yoon Kim is a very interesting thought leader, um, originally from South Korea. He's in Belgium when we talk um, virtually. And um, he told me this was the first podcast he's done. I thought he was great. Um, he's a really intelligent and thoughtful individual um, that didn't just take on the project of creating a microtransit service um, at face value. He really looked into uh, the why. So we dig into the why of microtransit and what is it going to take to make microtransit successful. Check out this episode in conversation with Nam Yoon. So today we're going to be talking about microtransit. Maybe two years ago, I found this article by this guy in South Korea that was writing about microtransit. And I thought, wow, th this research and design based perspective on microtransit is some of the best thinking that I've seen on the topic. And well, so uh, today I'm joined by Nam Yoon Kim. Uh, he is a UX designer by trade, and I look at him as an absolute expert in the concept of microtransit. So, Nam Yoon, welcome to the Commute Podcast. Really excited to have you here. Same here. Awesome. Thank you so much for yeah, those kind words. <laughs> I didn't so, expect this kind of reaction from my Medium post, but thank you so much. It really speaks to the world we're living in where somebody can have a thought, put it out there, and then on the other side of the world, um, somebody can be reading it um, and finding value from it. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast because I, I wanted to take stories from different parts of the world and get to share them internationally. So you're actually uh, dialing in today from Germany, right? Yeah, um, I worked in Korea for most of my life, um, but... I left around four weeks ago to relocate to Berlin, and I'm currently working in a um, e-commerce company as a UX designer here. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah, it's been a bit hectic though, like getting used to Berlin, finding housing and stuff. So, but yeah. you were saying the people are great, and uh, like oh yeah, the way of life is really great. Definitely, the atmosphere and the people are so chill here, and um, they're so accepting of who you are for the way you are. So, I mean, that's good, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. So when you, yeah. uh, you've only been there a couple of weeks, but it's uh, COVID, are you commuting at all? Um, I'm working from home. Okay. Uh, but it's actually a hotel room, so it's a bit uncomfortable, but still. I have been moving around a little with my mask on, for sure, and have a few friends here that I knew from before. So yeah, um, they introduced me to the city, like the atmosphere, and like, oh, this is how Berlin is, and I really like it so far. So what's um what's going to be your primary mode of commute once you get settled in? Oh oh sorry yeah so our company is going to be working on working from home until next mid next year, but my primary means I'm considering two just like just using my bicycle, or um, yeah I would have to use a tram or the subway. Yep, but it's not just one right. I think that's the 
kind of the beginning of microtransit is that it's part of a system where you're not just relying on one mode of transportation. So maybe start us off and give a little bit of background about how a UX designer got into thinking about microtransit. How did that start? Well, um, it's an interesting story, also kind of sad in that um, uh, my past employer, uh, we were trying to do a lot of different projects and services at the same time. So uh, I was working in a very small team and I was the only UX designer slash PM who was assigned to a project to create a, a shuttle service using some of the technologies that our company was um, investing in. And it was a very vague uh, mission that was like decided on by upper management, and it didn't have a real strategy. Uh, it didn't there was not enough research conducted to prove that this strategy will work. So I I kept on asking like what's our what's our take on this? Like why are we doing this again? <laughs> but I didn't get any clear answers. So I as a UX designer just had the initiative to get on with the strategy and figure it out on my own. And I would tell my boss like, hey, I, I'm not convinced here. Can I do my own research and figure out whether this is feasible and is also I don't know, profitable or whatever? And they were like, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I invested a lot of time conducting research to convince myself on whether this is a business model that will work and what the competitive edge it has compared to other modes of transportation in Korea at least. Yeah, you're you're kind of you've got the mindset of an engineer where you've got to really understand the why behind something, don't you? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, I also have a business background in college. I didn't major in design. I wanted to, but because of that, I guess background as a business like major in college and also my work experience as UX designer, it kind of creates some kind of form of synergy for me to approach. Yeah, yeah so you've got to figure out the why and the business model. So, yeah. like, so <laughs> when you started looking at microtransit, you weren't finding a lot. You, you didn't have an internal yeah. why. And the things you found weren't really good business models, right? <laughs> That's true, yeah. So yeah, it, this relates to the Medium post I wrote, but um, when I researched some of these shuttle services that were in Korea, they were so like inefficient. Everything was so manual. Like you were literally sending emails saying, I would like a shuttle service from this address to that address at this hour, please. And you'll like get back to you in a day or two, right? Yeah, yeah. And like the driver would literally draw it around if you have multiple stops. Like he would like literally figure it out by like, okay, this is the address, I'll, I'll go this way. Like whatever, right? So yep. seeing how inefficient as though they were as a part of a IT company, we were like, okay, so we have to use our strengths and that could be in terms of creating a lot of automation to make this more efficient, faster, and more on demand as possible. And to get a better understanding of like the routes that are most needed by people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's how, sorry. Well, I mean, you're, that's kind of how you got into the why and the the business model. Oh yeah. But it's. Right, right. It's good that you didn't just take this at face value. I think if you look globally at microtransit pilots from 2016 to 2019, they were, Mm. Google it, dismal failure, right? Um, Yeah. Microtransit has a really bad name because it was done so poorly. I think a lot of people didn't ask, um, not just why, but how are we going to do this forever? It was... Mm experimental in a lot of ways let's get some data but it was never looked at as how do we make a long-term sustainable business model out of that you asked those questions though in your research oh yeah oh yeah that's true um in so i split the medium post into two parts and the second part covers my analysis of the i guess like the attempts at microtransit in the u.s and korea and <clears throat> Some of the common pif- like common limitations that they face were so unfortunate in my opinion because some of them had a lot of potential. But like for instance, in Korea, there was a microtransit service that had the technology to make itself like more efficient and um, work in a bigger scale. Oh yeah, exactly that that exact example, call bus. But this company had the technology and the capacity to be more efficient and fast and automate a lot of their processes. But the Korean government said no, like you can't operate here. You can't operate in all the city and you can only operate at these like really late hours. And this is primarily because the taxi unions are so opposed to the idea of having this uh, microtransit service. 
And I feel like this was the, <clears throat> the limitation that really limited their success because they just couldn't like, have enough demand available to them to make a more scalable operation, right? Well, they were forced into having constraints that if you were making all of the decisions of your business model, you wouldn't have those constraints. Certain times, certain areas, limited use cases. Yeah. Um, it underscores the need for public-private support for something like this, mm -hmm. where the city has to get support for any existing transportation operators like taxis or transit. Was yeah. um, Call Bus a privately operated company? Yeah, it was. And they, because they had so many legal limitations, they partnered with Soul City kind of, uh, but I didn't think it panned out well because they just weren't yeah, given the opportunity to have more access to more writers. Yeah, yep. Yeah, definitely. The people didn't even know that it existed. You it's know, a marketing problem. We, we exactly. run into that often. It's one of the reasons why I try to avoid doing general consumer marketing and I focus on going through organizations because if mm -hmm. I can go through a business, I know I can find people that are going to a specific place on a regular basis. Right. The build it and they will come um, mm. has not proven to work for microtransit. I mean, that was Bridge's big problem is mm. they ran services and hoped that people would just show up. Exactly. Um, tra if transit agencies thought more like startups and they thought about customer acquisition costs, I think a lot of these, these microtransit programs mm. could be more successful. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's a common problem for a lot of public what is it like attempts by public organizations, right? Government agencies, <laughs> they don't have that mindset. I mean, some of them do, they gain it through partnerships and stuff, but yeah, I think that's an inherent like difference that you have to make, try to make up for. Yep. But the example you were talking about, right? About like targeting specific companies. The example right now we are looking at in my Medium post is a company that does that. So they, they would approach like, specific what is it companies and mm -hmm. like, like do sales and try to get them on board or they would have a system where they would really encourage other users who are interested in a specific route like okay i was like there's this user saying i want to get from like my home like, around my home to the office and like he would the user it's the user is encouraged to be their own sale person uh-huh to like have more people on board the route because the route would only start operating if there are enough people on board, right? So, so hi, let me think about the use case here for every <clears throat> shuttle. I'm a rider, I'm trying to build this. Yeah. I get my coworkers to sign up with me. And once exactly. we get to a certain number, we can launch the shuttle route. Right, so they That's would have cool. the users do their marketing on behalf of the company. How did that work uh, or how has it worked? Well, I think they're still operating. Do the riders pay for it or does the company pay for it? The, so the riders are paying for it. So okay. it's almost like a, yeah, they call it a crowdsourcing shuttle platform in that they would have all these riders come on board and say, okay, we are willing to pay this amount for this, this route and I have all these people on board. So can we start this initiate and then the shuttle and the platform will say, sure, you have, you have reached enough riders. So we will start operating this route. And yeah, um, I think it was a smart move to use word of mouth marketing by the riders to like encourage their like coworkers or even like friends from school. Mm -hmm. This is not only to limit it to like uh, the commute from like, home to work also includes with schools or academies or any other region that people are interested in. So. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good it's a smart method, but their limitation was, in my personal opinion, it took them a a few days, or like it would take them a lot of time, or there was like a lag yeah. until this route is actually like operated. And I felt that was a part where they had to really make it more efficient, and also the way they made the routes was also manual. Like the the bus rider, from what I remember or know, is they would actually go through that route once and look for the most efficient like stops and that itself would also be a manual process but that's a realistic limitation i understand but yeah well i mean yeah. that's part of the mvp process and getting these things to work i think one of the challenges exactly. for an everyone's shuttle is that it's a feature mm. the, it's the crowdsourcing to build a route is a feature and it can easily be replicated like we could yeah. uh, share mobility could replicate the ability you know the crowdsourcing function Exactly. Um, 
that's where I would love to partner with a company like Everyone Shuttle because their mm. feature could be a really great addition to a multimodal application because there may be times where building a, a shared route could be mm. really useful. Right. Yeah, definitely. I agree. It's not too dissimilar to the way that Chariot started out. You know, when exactly. Chariot first started in San Francisco, it was a crowdsource build your route. And then after they got acquired by Ford, they quickly shifted to a different model because they saw how tough it was to operationalize the crowdsourcing of it. It's, it wasn't repeatable enough. Mm. Yeah, I think it's exactly the same business model, actually. So I feel, I think that it came after Chariot started operating in the States. Yep. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. But everyone's shuttle somehow managed to survive, which is pretty impressive. And I think they're still growing their user base. So that's, that's good news. But that's a group I, I would be very interested in meeting. Yeah, but I haven't like seen like what kind of updates they have added recently. It's been yeah. a while since I worked in mobility. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, Chariot never was an option in, in South Korea. Am I correct on that? Is that something yeah. you guys looked at? Yeah, it's, it was, yeah, Chariot was not available in, in Korea. Yeah. I think it was limited in to the U.S. and also some parts of Europe. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. So I can actually kind of tear down Chariot's app a little bit, not, not in a bad way, <laughs> but like tear, um, you know, kind of yeah. deconstruct it. <laughs> uh, we went head to head with them for a while, I mean, uh -huh. from my perspective, there's no reason that they should have been shut down. It was a, it was a good business. Mm. They didn't continue with the crowdsourcing model after they got acquired by Ford. And oh. I think part of, the, part of the reason was that as a startup, you can only build so much tech. And mm. a lot of the tech they didn't have was around automating the crowdsourcing, automating the route building, so it could really scale. Yeah. And then you look at the feasibility of that business model. It required a lot of capital. You had to put vehicles out. You had to have a lot of assets in anticipation of volume. What they shifted into was a commuter service targeting white collar employers. The technology was more or less the same as being able to build a multi-stop route where people met at a, a location. So it was, no one gets picked up their, their door. It allowed you to create mm. a meetup spot. People could meet at that location. Mm. The downsides of the app was that there was no advanced scheduling. You could book one ride mm. at a time. You could only mm. book the ride you were taking the day of. And so I, be mm. I believe it was one hour before the actual ride time, the booking window would open. And so it would be this mad dash to get your, your ride oh scheduled. God. And you wouldn't know if on your return ride, you had a seat or not. Yeah. yeah I've learned from every that. single one of those things and built a feature into my product that does all of it. But I think it was the pursuit of a operationally profitable model that made them go away from crowdsourcing and into this corporate mm -hmm. commuter service. And that's a yeah. killer business. Like going into large companies, helping them create commuter services, uh, getting people to not drive cars to work is a mm. huge business. Mm. Think about it. Yeah. For any automaker, your number one car buying segment is people that are buying cars to get to work. Right. There's a mismatch in shareholder value when a new line of business starts detracting from people buying new vehicles. Mm. Why have billions of dollars not produced more results in mobility as a service when led by automakers? And I believe it comes down to that misalignment and in incentive. They don't yeah. realize how if they were to value time traveled instead of vehicles sold, they mm. could be making 10x on every asset. But it's a short-term way of thinking. It's a very, very short-term way yeah. of thinking. And so um, mm. I appreciate uh, all of the investment that went into a business like Chariot because it's allowed us to learn a lot. Um, yeah. Bridge was one of the very first ones that had a lot of struggles. Uh, it actually, I think, still operates in some capacity in Australia. Yeah, that's true. Um, 
Oh, they're still they're still live right now, or what? I'm not an ex. I don't know all the details, but I believe oh. the bridge software was acquired by a transit agency in Australia that was using oh, yeah. it, and yeah. so it's it's managed to stay alive in that capacity. Um, yeah. I remember that bridge rides cost twelve hundred dollars each to the city of Boston, and bridge is a really good example of why marketing matters mm. in all of this. Like, they just didn't get the ridership that is needed to make any of these services yeah. work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I feel like Bridge has so much potential because it was still one of the few companies that try to use big data, user trip data to um, estimate demand in the region. I mean, I think that was part that I was really impressed by. And also they were, the, the impression I got was that they prepared the fleets to operate in those high demand regions before uh, like users would like start really yeah. requesting trips as well. Yeah, but yeah, it was really sad to see, hear that. Um, yeah, it, the U.S. business failed. I had heard they were a little over-engineered, and by that I mean mm. killer product, mm. really, really killer technology that yeah. was far ahead of the actual service. Um, and it's an, I think it's an example of tech startups not taking the operations side seriously mm. because they don't want to do it. They mm. They see this, they see any operation of the fleet as a means to an end. Mm. And it was the operational side that ended up being like, they got tons of data. They built a great product, but because they didn't operationalize the service and get butts in seats, they ended up not, not getting renewed. And this has continued four years later, has continued to be um, an example of why microtransit won't work which we, you and I both know that that's not true. There's absolutely yeah. ways to make this work. Yeah. So, yeah, my analysis of all these different, um, what is it, existing services in the industry and also those that failed, uh, nailed down the obstacles or the reasons for failure to five key points. And I think this was, a, like when I was present, presenting this research to my team and trying to like convince them that, we have to avoid these obstacles. Like if you wanna, if you really wanna do a good job in this, we really have to avoid these obstacles. And I stress those, stress these um, points to the team. And yeah, those include inaccurate demand estimation leading to poor route selection and low ridership, and effective targeted marketing leading to insufficient demand and awareness, limited service region leading to restricted service growth, unscalable operation methods leading to high cost and limited expansion, and low cost effectiveness and low ridership leading to financial difficulties. Yeah. We should print these out and put them on the fridge <laughs> in every, uh, <laughs> every transit agency and, and operator. I mean, these are so, I was yeah. fascinated that you figured this out from not actually operating it yourself. Like a lot of the <laughs> lessons are firsthand learning that I had to get to this. Um, yeah. I, I look at these and, and, look at addressing them in a couple of buckets. One, mm -hmm. shifting microtransit so it's not on demand. On demand microtransit inherently affects one, two, and th maybe all five. Mm. On demand means there always has to be something there waiting in case somebody wants it. Yeah. Day one, Nobody knows to need it, right? There's no marketing behind it. Mm. We've addressed this by looking at scheduling as the killer application for microtransit. And mm. I think if you break down the term microtransit, I think transit is in it because it's something that can be relied on. Ride sharing isn't something that can be relied on. But a lot of the applications for microtransit tried to take what Uber and Lyft were doing with on-demand and say, okay, mm. now let's do that operational style mm. with microtransit. So we'll get more people and use bigger vehicles. And it's mm. not resulting in higher ridership. There's mm. a couple of companies that are trying to do on-demand transit. Mm. And it's still resulting in the same density that uber and lyft are getting but now you have yeah. uh, a higher paid driver 
a mm. higher cost asset and all the infrastructure in managing that fleet. If you can okay. do pre-bookings and scheduling, mm. you can know your demand in advance. Mm. I think the target marketing happens by getting organizations to be the referral partner. And, and this is businesses, schools, you know, businesses for their workforce, schools for their students, and healthcare providers, because that makes up 50% of all the transportation. Everything else is completely random, and yeah. it would cost a fortune to find everybody. But if you could focus on those three areas, you could catch half. Right. And so exactly. market to half, understand the demand of that half, and then service regions is something that on-demand tries to operate in an area mm. and say, okay, anytime in this area. And then what it tries to do is it says the service level is the same anywhere in this area. Instead of eliminating service area altogether and looking at it from a destination perspective. So you have mm. places where people want to go. And depending right. on how far the origin of that trip is, service area needs to be dynamic. And, and, um, you know, if you've ever, like, there's a couple of web tools where you can look at travel distance in time, not in miles, so that you can see, like, rural areas just take more time to get through, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't have the same service level in an area. It truly needs to be based on a specific destination. Yeah. And, and so if you get the businesses to be responsible mm. for managing their destinations, inviting the people to join, mm. then using available modes of services, there's gonna be less of a mismatch. Mm. And I believe microtransit should only operate when there's known demand. Yeah, I think that's a really important part that I realized. So my Medium post actually um, stresses the need for on-demand services in order to give the users the added convenience of getting a ride whenever they want. Totally. Um, at a, what is it, a lower price than a taxi, but uh, higher comfort than ridership, rider comfort than buses. But, um, but when we were, when in my past company, I was trying to make this like, so we can't like make a perfect like service that is on demand from the beginning, right? We don't mm -hmm. have the resources and capacity to create a fleet that covers entire like, city right that's just like it's too big of an investment so you're right i think the first steps that you really do have to take in considering the realistic limitations is to have guaranteed demand yeah i think that's the approach we also started taking started considering like so i was also thinking of the same thing uh, as you were in terms of creating commute routes for people for regions where both um, the companies where they work for and also where they live is in a similar vicinity it's not mm -hmm. too far apart so that would be a good pilot region to start with and figure out like what kind of operational difficulties or techni um, technological efficiencies we could try to aim for yeah but i definitely agree with you that um with the realistic limitations of trying to like like start this business and also continuously grow um you have to start from some guaranteed demand <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, and I don't Definitely. disagree with you that on-demand is a, su a superior user experience and it's mm. ultimately what people want. And right. I think in a perfect world of autonomous vehicles, on-demand <laughs> is what everyone has. Now, exactly. I also believe that if we don't fix a lot of our usage problems before we get to on-demand, there's that hell scenario of just more cars and uh, yeah. greater inequity. Yeah, In, definitely. On demand has come to be perceived as instant demand. Oh, it's on demand, which means I don't have to think about it at all. And I get it yeah. right now. That's for me, that's instant demand. You talked mm -hmm. about it as demand based or demand response. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think about demand as being um, a little bit of a spectrum. And mm -hmm. the further ahead you can plan that demand, the lower your cost should be and could be. That's true. Exactly. And yeah. I don't know if it's gamification or some type of rewards, uh, but if you can get commuters to be thinking about planning their trips in advance, those who do could save significantly. I think mm. that's the key to equitable access and bringing transportation into every neighborhood is getting 
those who can't afford it to change behavior and plan ahead. Mm. And, and if you're rich and you've got all the resources in the world, you don't have to plan ahead. You can, mm. you can think last minute because the monetary side doesn't matter and you're choosing convenience. But six out of seven people on this planet do not have access to a personal vehicle. And I think it's planned demand is, is, is essential. Yeah, I mean, and also it's the most basic and repeated form of transportation, I feel like, commuting. Yeah, And totally. it would be the one where, like, you would feel, I don't know, like, the commute itself is such a bother that you want to have a more comfortable ride anyway. So, yeah, I think that definitely makes sense. I agree with you there. So one of the last things I want to just touch on is kind of the, mm. the mode analysis that you did. Uh, mm. The design of this, I mean, clearly you're a designer. It's, it's really great. I've used this for like two years or so <laughs> as an example of ways that we could operate. Right. And then <laughs> like dollar signs, $5 signs is on the left. $1 sign is on the right. And as you move from fixed route, fixed stop with empty stops to a very dynamic, flexible solution, you're able to bring down costs significantly as well as convenience. Yeah, definitely. What, yeah. what are some highlights on this for you or what were some of the learnings you had um, that you think might be interesting for somebody that's thinking about how they can operationalize microtransit? Wait, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, what were some learnings you had from this, mm -hmm. from putting this together about different mm -hmm. modes um, that somebody who's thinking about microtransit might be able to learn from? So, I mean, I think obviously the biggest problem here is the technological like, capacity to make this uh, dynamic routing possible. And secondly is also, is there enough demand at that time to make these uh, route groupings possible? So. To be completely honest with you, I feel like the option on the left, sorry, the right. So the dynamic routing is realistically very difficult and unfeasible. It's very idealistic. And I feel like um, that, uh, yeah, it's just difficult to start from there and also expect that to happen. And I think that's what maybe like Bridge or some other companies that wanted to do on-demand microtransit um, started to realize. and. Yeah, so I personally, um, yeah, and I personally believe that achieving at least the, the, the fixed stops with reservation-based flex, flexible routing is the most feasible and realistic option that has a lot of efficiencies added compared to the fixed stops and the fixed routes. Yeah, because like options, uh, the first two methods are basically just buses and buses that skip certain stops where there's nobody in the bus stop or people don't like press the bell to get off. Mm -hmm. So we should at least strive for the third option and then proceed from there to dynamic routing as much as possible. And I think I took. share mobility has found that the conditional stops with reservation based flexible routing produces mm -hmm. um, the most efficient operations. Awesome. That's so yeah. great to hear. <laughs> yeah, by far. And here's the reason. It comes down to time on vehicle and willingness to spend time on vehicle in exchange for the convenience of not driving. Mm. And so the conditional stops, the condition is distance to destination. Mm. And it's dynamic. So that within a company, somebody that might be commuting two miles sees different options than somebody that's commuting 15 miles or 20 miles because that 20 mile commuter can't have a door to door option. Just can't period. But they still need to have a good experience it has to be really easy to book. And we have to be smart about choosing what their we call them flex stops, right? This, mm. this ability to move a stop around. Yeah, good name. If you mix, door to door and flex route, which is the last one, it ends up being a little bit longer and you have such a difference in experience for the riders that there can be a little bit of a heartburn in why is that rider getting picked up at their door and I got, I had to go pick 
pick up, get picked yeah. up at a, a meetup spot. Um, right. You know, I think a lot, eventually it'll come down to communicating to the rider that like, hey, we're picking up this person because it saves everybody and, and why it's a good thing. We'll get there. But the second la to last diagram is really the killer application for microtransit where mm. somebody could be getting picked up um, th that that dependent on distance from destination, the stops can change. And yeah. for us, um, routing is less about the actual directions you take and more about the sequencing and ordering of people together. Mm. Mm, true, definitely. That's like the, that's another huge chunk, right? Just figuring out which order, <laughs> which people to pick up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's um, a whole another algorithm there. <laughs> Completely, completely. Um, so look at the reservation row. Mm. If there's no demand data, it requires subsidy. Mm. Transit, transportation subsidy comes from two things, government, mm. investors. Right, right. You know, um, all of the mobility companies that have had a no demand data business model have required significant amounts of investor funding to be able to grow. Transit chooses to operate under having no demand data and they're subsidized to be able to do this. That's, right. that's the beauty of the transit agency's business model. They're allowed <laughs> to not have to be profitable so that they can provide services that people need. Exactly, right. But I wanna be around in two years. I wanna be, I wanna be around in six months. <laughs> I don't have the option of choosing to have no demand data. Yeah. Um, I also disagree with some perspectives that you could use AI to predict the demand. Mm. And this is, uh, it's chaos theory. Mm. It's the chaos theory of the commute. And, and the chaos theory of the commute is around how each of us make small decisions every single morning as we're going to work that change when we get on the road, what slot we are in the highway, how we contribute to or um, against traffic and congestion. And every single person wakes up in the morning and figures this out on their own, right? Employers have conditioned this to us. How do you get to work? It's on you, mm -hmm. right? If we can avoid that chaos, get more people to plan their morning commutes so it's more and more repeatable, that could have a serious reduction on on commuter uh, congestion. Oh well, yeah, definitely, man. Like <laughs> the traffic is horrible, right? <laughs> Everywhere. It's it's oh, uh, God. no matter, yeah. and it's all relative. Like uh, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Our traffic is not bad. For anybody that visits here from a bigger city, goes, man, you don't you have no rush hour traffic. But it's all relative. It's what you experience every day, and nobody right. wants to uh, spend that much time in their car. Yeah. Definitely. Now this is this is fascinating stuff. You're gonna th th this was really great um, research, and we will make sure to include a link to your medium posts mm -hmm. uh, with our podcast because I think anybody that's interested in I could just even even somebody who's in interested in design, I think could get a lot of value from seeing how you think through this problem. Yeah. Um, and then you had some designs about apps and. Um, Oh, this is actually not my design. This of course. No, no, you included oh. some designs. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did it because, like, I, this is an update I made later um, after making the initial version. But um, after seeing how Uber and Lyft a few years back, they're trying to create a microtransit service that was on demand with larger vehicles. But I remember that they also stopped servicing them as well. But after seeing that, I was like, oh, God, if Uber and Lyft did it, it would be amazing if we had this on-demand like, microtransit system. But it later turned out that you know, they weren't real big successes for them either, from what I remember. Like, I remember like they serviced it for a time, but they discontinued it. They had yeah. no demand data. Exactly. Or like, yeah, they, they wouldn't have guaranteed demand, right? It was, like you said, chaos theory. You cannot expect it. It's difficult, so... It worked in San Francisco. I mean, I used Uber oh. Pool and Lyft Line in San Francisco, and you get matched with two to three people. And right. it works when you have very, very high density. Mm. These pooled services were never available in my, my city. We have a million people. No, no mm. one, 
they, they were they did not become available in Columbus. Mm. I my pitch to Uber and Lyft here is look the pooled option is absolutely valuable. What mm. you've got to do is get people to plan in advance for their right. ride and get drivers to commit in advance to serving those rides. Right. That's going to make more of a subscription like experience. Make it super mm. easy to book a ride out uh, for an entire month and say, I'm going to take this every day. And the more you take it, the more you save. And it should be dynamic mm. pricing. Further you book in advance, the more rides you book, the lower your cost is. And mm. that could make services like this work in any market. Exactly. Uh, I think employers become the key to finding the audience the audience of people that would use a pooled service because they're going to a job at the same place at the same time. Right, right. I feel like um, when it comes down to like what the most common routes you take and like where you spend the most time like, like traveling anywhere is commute, right? Totally. It comes down to that. So you're so right in terms of concentrating on that first. Yeah, and I feel like microtransit can really, it has the most potential in that space, definitely. Yeah. Microtransit, I think long term is going to be a, a big winner. There's been a lot of hiccups. I'll be generous mm. with that. There's been a lot of hiccups in microtransit, but there are uh, people like us that are finding ways to make it work. Their mm. public private partnerships are a big part of that. But maybe you could just kind of wrap up some of your kind of key learnings around microtransit. Uh, can you give me a few minutes to just review this? Yeah, totally. Can, yeah. Edit, editing it out <laughs> right sorry no no no. we'll cut this out this is great by the way this is an awesome conversation there's going to be so many good sound bites in here and i hope hope yeah and if you need any more like i'm more than available so yeah please no this is great Oh, there's a there's a like a typo. Microtransit services need to effectively <laughs> forecast, but it's effective. Effective. Anyway, I yeah, know. effectively. I didn't catch it. Uh, don't Thank worry. Thank you. <laughs> How many people have read this, by the way? I'm curious. I haven't checked recently, but um, yeah, it's 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 not enough. That's if it's only yeah. got twenty <laughs> claps, not enough. Yeah, it's not the most popular post to have, but really, I feel like. The people who do read it, I mean, the, yeah, I feel like, um, yeah. You've got a lot of like app design stuff, teardowns and things like that, right? Uh, those are like practices I had, like I was just practice copying, like, cause I don't have a design background. I wanted to improve on it. So I was just like, learn how other services designed and try to learn some more patterns and stuff. But, uh huh. That's yeah. how I started. Um, my, my career, I'm a marketer by trade and I got into graphic design when I was in college. Whoa. And so my career was very much made by being able to take an idea and then design it. So mm. like I've done all the branding. I built our website. I do all of our yeah. marketing. I've done all of our like, or not all, but a lot of the UI UX design of our product right. um, I've had a hand in. Yeah, so I, I love, I love the design side of this. Yeah. I feel like design, like especially UX design and the role that I had in my Korean company, it was a UX design slash PM role, right? So we were designing like everything, like, not, like designing the operation process, like designing the business model kind of, it would be conceptual, but still very like helpful in terms of like finding direction for the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This can be kind of just your closing word on on your thoughts yeah. on microtransit. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm kind of ready. Um, cool. So, Namun, maybe you can just kind of wrap up your thoughts on microtransit and take us out. Right. So if you read the Medium post, you just get a good understand, just like a summarized understanding, because of Julia of why shuttles have the potential to be more competitive. Like, especially like, as you mentioned for even commutes, because it allows users to have pay less for 
pay less than a taxi, but get more comfortable rides compared to buses. And I see that potential there. And I feel that um, in order to maximize the higher operation costs of shuttles compared to the total rider, rider capacity, that you really have to try to make the system of routing, grouping riders, designating stops to be very efficient and scalable, right? In order to make, in order to compensate for the added operation costs of operating a very expensive fleet of shuttles. So, and realistically, I feel that um, it's really difficult um, to have all the technological capacity to have that all automated from the beginning. So yeah, I, even myself, I realized that after like trying to make such a project happen that realistically there's so many limitations that you have to um, take it in phases and start off with a pilot that works and then like try to get more demand and guarantee demands. And as you mentioned, like schedule a commute, commute route, right? And I feel like you have to take it in phases and continue to progress to a form that is really optimized and efficient and more convenient for users as much as possible. And one last part was, I feel governments really have to give more space and opportunities for such shuttle services, microtransit services to like, yeah, to work. Because I feel like a lot of these attempts, the scale of the demand or the opportunities given to some of these companies by government agencies is very limited. Mm -hmm. And I feel that if they just don't give a lot of companies from what I saw, um, the chance to actually prove themselves that this is a feasible like form of transportation. And that's one unfortunate thing. And I hope that more governments are more willing to <laughs> allow more modes of transportation to take the space and help people commute more comfortably <laughs> at better rates. Well, we're still in the earliest days of microtransit. Uh, mm. I appreciate what you've done for research and your contributions to my own learning. Um, really happy to have this conversation with you today. Nam Yoon Kim, thanks so much for being on the Commute podcast. Oh, my honor. I'm so excited for what you're doing too. <laughs> Thanks, hope, man. I hope to see like continue growing and have more writers. Like, yeah. Great, man. I appreciate it a lot. Awesome stuff. Yeah.